folks, as you know, Upside of 40 is devoted to men over the age of 40 and beyond. That means most have been grilling for a long time, and they think they've been doing it right. Well, boys, think again, because today it's time to go back to school and learn the basics from a master, a master of all things meat, a doctor of grillology, and I hope he will forgive me for that. Welcome, pit master Malcolm Reed. Hey, Malcolm. Hey, Sean, that's the first time I've been called doctor of anything. I'll take it. <laughs> I like it. Doctor of Grillology. You can have that, okay? I'm going to give that to you. <laughs> hey, Malcolm, you come with some incredible credentials. You've won countless uh, barbecue awards, uh, have a very successful YouTube channel with millions of views on there, and, of course, the How to BBQ Right uh, podcast. Uh, how did all this start for you? Well, we we started uh, in the competition barbecue. Uh, our little town had a you know had a contest. I remember growing up as a kid, me and my brother would go hang out there. And as we got older, we decided to try our hand at cooking at it, and uh, we just kind of went from there. It was it was really just something fun to do, and and we kind of turned it into uh, uh, more of a career, I guess you would say. Me and my wife did. I met her along the way, and about the time that I turned into professional barbecue cook. And uh, we've, we've made a little business out of it. Yeah, and I know you grew up in the, uh, the Memphis area. And, um, you know, it's really a way of life there in a sense. Why is, uh, you know, uh, barbecue, you know, so important to that part of the country? Well, I, you know, I think barbecue in a way is important to everybody, especially here in the South, because it just it usually means good times. I mean, when we grew up, you know, around any major holiday, we were outside grilling, you know, Memorial Day, 4th of July, Labor Day. Those are big holidays where people get the grill up. And we're SEC football country here, so there's always somebody to tailgate with the grill. And it's just a, a big part of, of what we do, uh, you know, socialize with friends and family. And, it's, and, and I got into it because I like cooking for people, and, you know, and, and it just makes you feel good to, for somebody to eat something you cook and then just, you know, for them to be blown away by it. Yeah. Well, it, it seems like it's, you know, maybe, I don't know if you call it a hobby, but, you know, growing up, you mentioned how you got into it. Was it a, was a family thing? And then how did it, you know, grow to be more and more serious? Well, really, it was a more of a competitive thing than a family thing. Um, Memphis and May is one of the big, you know, the big four barbecue competitions in the U.S. And um, that's it's always in the middle of May every year. And these other little contests like in my hometown were feeder contests for it. That's where guys went, honed their skills to get ready for the world championship. And so there was a lot of world champions that, that come from DeSoto County, Mississippi, where I live. And we would cook against each other week in and week out. And if you wanted to beat them, you didn't have any choice but to learn how to do it right to get better at it. So, you know, we kind of – I guess the competitive side of it, it's, it's more – it's more than just, you know, feeding somebody at your house, having a party. It's, it's really, we're trying to beat the next guy to cook better barbecue. That's what started it all for me. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, uh, funny, I like out of the Western part of the country, you know, and you, you tell people, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I think I'm pretty good on the grill. And they kind of laugh at you because they don't take it seriously and they don't understand how much of a science there is to it. And, uh, you know, just how tremendous uh, it is when it's done right. It, you know, it's some of the best cuisine, and, it, you know, people think of barbecue, they think of throwing some hot dogs or burgers on the grill most of the time, but it's way more than that. We're taking, you know, uh, lesser cuts of meat and turning them into something that, that'll rival something you would see on a fancy French menu, and that's what, you know, we're trying to do with it, and, and, and it's became more mainstream. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, this podcast, Malcolm, is for men over 40 and beyond, so that means... Uh, most of them have been lighting up a grill for a long time. But what are some of the biggest mistakes that people make uh, attempting to do a uh, barbecue right? Well, I would say some of the most most common things that I see or I get questions on is on fire management. Um, you know, you have to understand whatever kind of grill you're cooking on. There's all different kinds of barbecue pits and barbecue grills out there. But you have to learn how the equipment you have operates. And it's all about oxygen and fire. Fire has to have that airflow for it to burn properly. And for you to get smoke or the right temperatures you need to cook at, you have to learn how to control that fire, control that air. Yeah, and, the, and uh, that's probably one of the biggest things is they, they burn everything. And they think that they know what the temperature is and uh, you know what they think medium rare is. And we'll get into more of uh, how you get there. But... Um, 
you know, you have so many awesome recipes on your website, how to bbqright.com. And, and I watched a few yesterday, including that tomahawk ribeye. Oh my God, just watching it, I was starving. And of course, your, your Jack Daniels ribs with the Jack uh, and Coke spritz, <laughs> that just <laughs> looks tremendous. But for this episode, and we're gonna start out uh, slow here because we got people that are listening that, like I said, think they know how to grill, but they really don't have any idea. So let's start with the basics. And you know, I actually worked at a steakhouse uh, when I was in high school and it helped uh, pay my way through school when I went into college. And of course, I never became a uh, pit master by any means, but I learned a lot about meat then. And I know that that's really important uh, about a cut of meat. So can you give us the basics about when we go out to select a piece of meat and what it should look like? Well, it, for me, it comes down to wanting to know that I'm buying meat from a reputable place. I mean, you know, if you just go to, to Walmart or to your local grocery, get something out of the bin, you really don't know the quality of it. I like to spend a little bit more if I can. You know, there's times where you, you can take a lesser cut, but it's a better quality and turn it into something fantastic. So I look for uh, I look for like brands like the Certified Angus Beef brand, or I look for reputable chicken brands if I'm buying chicken, or reputable pork brands like Smithfield or Prairie Fresh or somebody like that if I'm buying pork. It, it all comes down to uh, kind of knowing like what you said, what to go look for. Um, I look for meat that's got well marbled, that looks fresh in the package, that has good color, doesn't look like it's pumped full of dyes. Um, you know, really, a lot of people are on this, you know, or used to be on this no fat kick, but fat's really not your enemy when it comes to cooking. I mean, fat's flavor, and there, you know, there's good fats and bad fats, but when it comes to meat, most of it's pretty good fats. Yeah, that gives it the, uh, the great flavor. A lot of people don't get that. Um, and, uh, you know, I know on some of your videos, you mentioned like you pick up meat at, at Costco. So it's not like you have to go to some you know expensive butcher shop uh, to find good meat, right? That's absolutely. Costco is one of my favorite. Costco's and Sam's Clubs. Most people yeah. use those and they all have really good meat. But, you know, a lot of those things started out as, as uh, kind of restaurant supplies type places. So they source better meat. They turn a lot of meat. So it's a lot of times it's fresher, but they have real butchers in there that are, that are putting those cuts out. It's not, it's not like that stuff's coming trucked in and they're just setting it out. It's, you know, there's, they, there's a lot of effort goes into the meat department at Costco and Sam's. Yeah. And you know, there's, there are a lot of, cut of uh, cuts of meat uh, that you, you grill up and uh, also smoke. But as I said, we're going to keep it simple with this episode and, so you're having friends over, say, for a barbecue on Saturday, and uh, would you recommend most like sticking to, say, either a New York strip or ribeye? Uh, what, what, you know, if you really just want to have a something like that, a gathering, what kind of meat do you suggest? Well, for me, picking a steak's kind of like picking your favorite brand of car or whatever. There's all kinds of good ones out there. Um, I like the ribeye. I'm a ribeye guy. It has, uh, you know, the right amount of fat in it to give it a lot of flavor but it also has a real beefy flavor coming off that loin of the cow. So um, I, I usually go for that. If you want something a little more on the lean side, you can go strip or either filet. Filets are awesome, uh, but you know, the, to me, a filet is more of what you're putting on it because it's, you know, it doesn't have a lot of fat to give it flavor. So it can, it can take the different seasonings or different preparations. But I would stick with a ribeye and know how to cook it really well. Okay, and, and on that, and you mentioned marbling, and we talk about the fat in a steak, and this is a mistake a lot of people make is that they think it's they don't think it's a good cut of meat because they see all that uh, marbling in it and the fat on it. When actually picking a steak like that uh, can be tremendously flavorful, and so uh, tell us a little bit about what to look for when you are and, and what you know marbling really looks like. Sure. Well, when we talk about marbling, I'm not talking about the big deposits of fat that's kind of around the steak or at the tail end of it or even in the center. I'm talking about the fat that's kind of flaked throughout the muscle. And when you look at it, you know, uh, most of the time beef is it's made up of different muscle groups and it'll have a marbled look. If you think of like the way tile or a piece of marble looks, like you can see the veins running through it. It'll have little flakes of fat all in it. The more, the more fat it has, the higher that beef's going to be. And beef, you know, you have three different grades of beef primarily in the U.S. You've got your select, which is your lower end. It's uh, not as much fat marbling. You've got choice, which is about mid-grade, which most of the time, that's what we see in supermarkets. And then you've got prime grade, which has a lot of marbling. And that's the best, but you're going to pay for it. Yeah. 
And, and uh, we've mentioned, you know, Costco and Sam's Club, they have those higher grades of beef. I mean, you can get lower grades there, but they do have their own prime that they, they sell theirs too, right? Sure. So, Most of those are USDA prime, and it's a, it's a good brand of beef. That, um, when, when, all, when all the uh, the steers are graded, when they come into the market, you know, they have actual people there that, that, that take a sample of those loins and they classify them by that marbling. That's that's one of the classifications. How much marbling does it have? Which way does it go? The way they can sell it. Yeah, and and when you're selecting these, uh, is there a thickness that you like for the grill? Um, you know, I like to stick around 14 to 16 ounce steaks for ribeyes. That's a it's about an inch and a quarter to inch and three eighths thick. Um, they cook really even, so you get a you know even temperature across the whole steak. And they cook in about, you know, in a good hot fire, eight to 10 minutes, depending on, you know, how, how well, how well done or what, wherever you like them. I'm a medium rare guy myself. So I like to be, you know, I like that pink most of the way through. And, you know, that, that's just the way I like to eat them. Yeah, I'm right there with you on that one. So you say about a, an inch and a quarter is the, the thick thickness of the steak you're looking for. Get yourself a good piece of meat that's got good barbling. And, and those, and people at these, uh, these stores will help you out. They've got, uh, a lot of these Sam's clubs now have guys behind the counter right there for you to help you out. So you want to get yourself a good uh, piece of meat. And then uh, you, what are you going to grill it on? And I know you love, I think you got the, the PS360 that uh, you grill a lot of your stuff on. But uh, what's a good uh, kind of grill for somebody to, to cook a, a good steak on? Well, I would say probably the number one grill that most people are familiar with is just that classic Weber kettle. And those things are so versatile, man. That's a design that came out a long time ago, I guess back in the 30s or 40s. Uh, Weber came out with that grill, and you can do all kinds of things with it, but it's hard to beat a good steak cooked over a charcoal fire. Uh, and that's with a ton of flavor. I mean, there's, you know, you can use gas grills, you can use pellet grills, but, but that actual coals burning and that fat rendering and dripping on those coals just produces the best flavor that you can possibly get. And you mentioned the, the charcoal, though. I mean, the same stuff you pick up at the store, or is there something that you can get uh, that's that's better than that? Well, for cooking steaks, I really like to burn lump coal because it burns a little better. It's actually a you know a product of real wood. You know, they burn it down and make those lump pieces. Lump burns a lot higher temp. It gives you more BTU, so it doesn't last as long. But for for cooking at high temperatures, like grilling steaks, uh, it works great. Um, I do like charcoal, too. There's a place for it. When I'm doing longer cooks, I use charcoal, but I use a good brand. Uh, I, I don't like, you know, just a store brand that has a lot of filler in it. You want something that's more all natural. That it's mainly wood. Uh, you know, a lot of times with that charcoal, they'll put other chemicals and, and starches and stuff in there to make those coals stick together. And you don't want that. You know, that's that's not uh, it, the flavors come out in your food. It burns those impurities off and it actually gets in your food. So if you use a good quality charcoal, I mean, I, I'm a Royal Oak Chef Select guy. That's been a charcoal that I've used for a long time. Uh, it's a little specialty charcoal. It can be hard to find, but if you contact Royal Oak or do a little searching for it, you can find it. How about, how about uh, wood, uh, other types of wood? I mean, I, my, uh, my, my dad, uh, you know, I live out here in Arizona, Malcolm, and, and uh, we got our mesquite trees, and uh, he loves to cook his steaks on, uh, over mesquite. Uh, is there other types of wood, and, and uh, have you heard of that type of people using mesquite uh, like sure. they do out here? It's, you know, wood wood flavors are kind of a regional thing, like you said. It's kind of what you grow up to and what taste you're used to using. Um, we we use a lot of hickory here in the, where I am in the Memphis area. That's just the wood of choice. I supplement it with um, a little fruit wood. I like cherry and apple, and I'll even throw in a little pecan. But um, it, it kind of, it's, it's up to you. Um, there's a lot of charts out there that you can, and on the website, you can see about different types of, of woods that go with different types of meats, but it's, it's really a personal preference. Um, what I will say about wood is a little goes a long way. That's something I learned in my, my barbecue career that you can easily over smoke uh, meat. Um, so a lot of people think that you have to get a fire going and you have to put wood on there or you have to soak the wood. So it produces all this white smoke. Well, that's not the kind of smoke you want. Your smoke needs to be very, very faint blue, almost invisible. And that's when you're really getting the flavors. I um, mean, so we just burn a bed of coals and then we add chunks of seasoned wood on it for flavor. Ah, so you add it with, you use it with, uh, with the charcoal. Combination, right. You can burn it down, create your own coals with wood and then, you know, add a little, 
supplemental to those hot coals for your smoke. But if, if you drive, if you're driving, you know, hundred percent mesquite wood, you're going to end up with bitter tasting food. A lot of times okay. it's all, and it's, then again, it's all on the cleanness of your fire. How good your fire's running. Yeah. Now, uh, before we move on with that, and I, uh, I know you use, a you like getting back, you said the Weber barrel, which is not a real expensive grill, but you say it works. Uh, and then also, do you use a, 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 a charcoal chimney to get it going? And how does that work? Well, a charcoal chimney, it, it, it's basically um, just kind of a metal tube with a handle, typically. And it has a little grate caught in there about two inches from the bottom to, to allow you to put some newspaper or some kind of fire starter under the bottom to get the coals going. You pour your, your coal, whether it's lump or charcoal briquettes, inside the little chimney, the tube. And then you start a fire underneath it and you and it the the way they're stacked up, the air blowing up with the heat coming up makes all those coals ignite and get to the right temperature uh, faster than they would if you spread them out in your grill and tried to light them. You don't yeah, have to worry about I'm using like a couple of those charter. Sorry? You don't have to worry about using like that chemical starter, you know, um, any of that lighter fluid stuff. You you want to stay away from that because all that can give you the, your uh, food a bad taste as well. Yeah, and I, I saw that you also use these starter, uh, I don't know what they're, charcoals or, or, or bricks that you put underneath, and that helps start those uh, those coals? Yeah, they're, I've, I've used uh, wax cubes, which are like paraffin wax with an accelerant oil in it that's non, uh, that doesn't have a taste. Um, they make all kinds. They make some compressed wood ones that, that have a little bit of wax in them to where they'll burn a long time. But really, that's just the, the igniter, the initial heat to get the flame going. Once those first few coals on the bottom of that chimney catch fire, it's going to draft up. It's pulling everything up to, for the for the heat to escape. So it ignites all of them at the same time. Um, even plain newspaper works. Uh, you want to stick. You want to stay away from anything printed with ink. If you you know, I know the newspaper business is struggling right now. But if you still, if you still subscribe to a newspaper, you know it, it's, it makes a great uh, uh, chimney starter. Yeah, it sure does. But uh... I know that uh, that that the heat part of this is really important. Once you get those coals going, as you just mentioned here, uh, but you use thermometers a lot for not only uh, you know testing the meat, but also uh, you want it at a certain temperature with those coals to be before you even put anything on the grill. Sure, the, um, you know besides my grill, my meat thermometers are probably the you know most important thing that I cook with because cooking um, it's kind of subjective on the flavor department. But time and temperature is something that everybody should be cooking to. Um, you have to get the grill up depending on, you know, what time you want your food done, what determines what temperature you need to cook it at. And then when you're grilling, you have to have, a, you know, you want to be up over 500 degrees to sear those steaks to really get those good grill marks. So you have to have those temps raised up and you have to know what they are. Um, I use a bunch of different types of thermometers. I have some of the wired probe ones that, that, you know, you can clip on the grill grate and watch your grate temperature the whole time. You can put a probe in the meat and watch it while it cooks so you don't have to open the lid and let your heat out. And then I use handheld instant read thermometers to verify what my temperatures are in those ribeyes or in those pork butts or whatever it is I'm cooking. That way I know exactly what the temperature is and where it's at and when it needs to come off the grill. Yeah, and I hope you guys out there listening uh, are hearing this because this is a pit master. He's telling you it's it's okay to use thermometers. You should use thermometers. We're going to get into more of that when we actually uh, talk about putting the meat on the grill. But it the the fire needs to be a certain temperature, and and there are special thermometers just for that. Well, most most grills come with the thermometer built in. Now, a lot of times they're not of the highest quality, but they're a good gauge of what temperature you're actually at. Um, I always suggest uh, getting some type of a uh, wired probe thermometer that comes with a little grate clip so that doesn't matter what the temperature is at the fire. It, it, what really matters is where your food's going, what that temperature is right there. So I'll clip a probe right beside where I'm going to put my steak or where I'm going to lay that piece of chicken. That way I know what temperature it's cooking at. So say uh, just, uh, you know, picking out here what you know, we're talking about ribeye and uh, it, you said about 500 degrees is where that what that area should be at. Yeah, that's a great optimal temperature uh, for cooking. If you know if you're cooking on any other type of grill, like a, a gas grill or something, you want it uh, up on that medium high to high zone. Um, if, you know, if, but if, if I'm running a charcoal, usually in a Weber kettle, one good chimney of hot coals is going to get me that right temperature with those vents 100% open. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't know if you consider it sacrilegious, but uh, you know, a lot of people don't have the time when they want to come home, maybe from dinner, and they want to they want to cook a, gr uh, a steak, and they've got a gas grill. Everybody's got a ga gas grill. Can you cook a good steak on a gas grill? Absolutely, uh, man. I don't I don't think there's any. You know, my thing with how to barbecue right, the only wrong way is to not do it. <laughs> there's all kinds <laughs> of ways. So uh, there's nothing wrong with gas grills. In fact, I have some recipes on on my website using them. Um, you can set those things. You can. You need to learn your gas grill. Learn how to set it up for hot and fast searing, you know, to, to really cook a good steak. Learn how to set it up for a two-zone fire to where you can get some of those longer cooks on it and do things like ribs and chicken really well. But, yeah, there's a place for all those grills, man. And is there ways that you can make it uh, your steak better with a, a gas grill? I don't know to make the, the seasoning better. Can you put I don't know, wood or something in there? Are the things you can do? Sure, they may. You know, I've seen um, there's several types of of uh, gadgets or accessories they make that you can uh, you know burn wood chips in. That's like little pans with lids. The simplest way for me is to get you some wood chips, whatever flavor you like. Take some aluminum foil, and I and I call it making like a wood smoke bomb. I'll put those chips in some foil and bring the foil up around it to where it's a little pouch, and then take a knife and just poke some holes in it. And then you can set that foil bomb right down by your heating element, and it's not going to burn the foil, but it'll heat that wood up enough to where it combusts and it produces smoke because it can't get too much air. And that's where you're getting some of that smoke flavor from. And you can place that right on uh, top of the, the, the jets, or where do you put that? Uh, most of the time, you know, most of these grills nowadays, they either have some type of substrate in them, whether it's a lava rock or some kind of a heat deflector that's over the actual burner. You're not make, you're not putting it in direct contact with the flame. It's actually setting on something, but it still gets pretty hot. Okay, so uh, we're, we're ready to go with the grill. Let's say we get the, the temperatures right. Uh, we've got what we should be cooking with. Um now let's get to the meat, and we've got ourselves saying a good ribeye we've picked out. Uh, what about the seasoning? Now, I'm a, a salt and pepper guy. I know that uh, the, that's pretty much the base for you, but you add a, a few other things, and you've got all kinds of seasonings with your, your killer hogs. But uh, tell me a little bit about that and, and seasoning, seasoning the meat. Well, for me, you know, a steak needs some seasoning, and really so you could get a buy with just salt and pepper, no problem. Uh, it makes a really good steak. Uh, I like to add a little garlic. I like those savory notes to it. Um, when, when we're cooking steaks around here, I'll add a little bit of a hot barbecue rub. I don't like anything really sweet on my steak, so I tend to stay away from anything with sugar in it. But if it has some different peppers and different herbs and spices and stuff, that usually goes pretty well. But um, I, I don't go heavy with it. I mean, I you know, salt and pepper is one thing, but going too heavy with any other seasons, it takes away from the actual beef flavor. So you don't want to cover it up. The goal is to add seasonings that's going to make that steak flavor come out, to let you really taste the beef. And so that's why a lot of people just like salt and pepper. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, pretty much, you know, I know people have had like, they put lorries all over it and they just, they kill it. They, uh, so salt and pepper. And then um, also you, you mentioned that some garlic with it. That's a real good start. Sure. I mean, just keep it. I, I, I say the best way to cook a steak is start out basic. And then when you, you know, when you want to start playing with it and making that, you know, steak have your own unique, unique style or taste, that's when you start adjusting those flavors and experiment with different rubs or different combinations of seasonings on it. Yeah. Okay. So when we, we uh, put it on the grill and um, I know that there's different things you can do with that. I know you've got the, the slats the, 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 that, uh, you know, mimic like a restaurant grill, but um, your basic grill is you, you, uh, you put it whereabouts on the grill is it the hottest part or you know how do you select doing that well for cooking a ribeye like this i like to just direct cook them over over a single source of heat so yeah. um you know if, if you don't if you're just cooking on a standard grate that comes with your grill you just want to get it on there and get some surface contact um i don't i don't like to weight them down because i think that pushes pushes some of the moisture out as that steak's cooking and you know it, it mess, messes the look of them up but I, what I do like to do is when I place it on the grill, I just take my hand and just kind of firmly press down a little bit to make sure it's making good surface contact on those hot grates. And then you just need to leave it alone. Let it cook for two minutes. Don't touch it. Don't do anything to it. Um, and, and then after that two minutes, what you want to do is kind of rotate it. 
And then there's, and what I typically do is rotate it like 90 degrees. That's going to give you a good cross hatch on it. When you rotate it, you want to press it down gently again, make sure it's making good contact on that side, and then set you a timer for another two minutes, and then it's going to be ready to flip that steak over to the opposite side. You're just going to repeat that process again. You know, uh, you just uh, mentioned that, like how you how you cook it, and the way I was taught, or the way I, you know, I know probably 90 plus percent people out there, they do they put it on there, and then maybe they leave it there for two minutes, and then they flip it over. And they leave it there and they flip it back. Why do just the turn? Well, I, I like to let it give a good side, a good temperature to caramelize on that one side first, where it's cooking from that bottom side up. And then I flip it over to that cool side and let it have a chance to cook up from that side as well. So it's more even across. And I've seen some train of thought where people thought, you, you know, you can try to flip them like that. I don't think it's right or wrong. I think, um, you know, as long as you're watching those internal temperatures and got your grill at the proper temperature to cook that steak, that you'll be fine. Um, you just don't need to, to mess with it. The more you have that lid off and you're turning that steak, the, the more time it's going to take to cook because you're losing heat. Yeah, and, and let's talk about that the temperature that you mentioned and getting a, a good meat thermometer. Uh, tell us what a, a good one is, and then how do you take the temperature of a steak while you're cooking it? Well, what I do, I, I use a, a, it's called a Thermapin by Thermalworks, and it's just an instant read thermometer. Uh, they're really popular in the chef world, but we use them, everybody in the barbecue world has them too. They make, uh, there's several different companies, and I think Maverick's one that makes a good instant read, but the, you know, you can find them just about everywhere. But uh, that's, um, the key is, you know, getting one that's pretty accurate. You want to test that accuracy and make sure it's right. And then when I check a ribeye, I'm going in uh, from the side or either from the top halfway down. You, you got to make sure that you go down far enough to where the temp comes up and then pull it back a little bit to get a true reading. That's the best way to check it. When, I, when I'm teaching people how to check the internal temperature, we'll, we'll watch it. As soon as we stick it in, you'll see it's going to be really high because your heat's on the outside. You'll hit a cool zone, and then when you get deeper down in it, you'll come back. You're almost getting to the other side. You'll see the temperature increase where it's coming back to that hot zone. So you pull it back to the coolest spot, and that's your actual temperature, if that makes sense. <laughs> no, 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 I hear what you're saying, because that's, you don't know. I mean, most people, you're shooting for the very center of that stake. Is that pretty much a good guide? That's an excellent guide. I mean, I, I check it. I usually check my ribeyes right in what's called the eye of the ribeye, you know, the biggest muscle that's in there. I want to know what that ribeye is. And for me... I'm looking somewhere between 125 and 128. That's perfect, medium rare. Uh, that's where I like to take them off at. It's still going to give me a you know a lot of good pink uh, pink meat throughout it. Right. And what's well, give me the range though from rare to medium well to you know what temperatures are we talking there? Well, usually so rare is usually from 120 to 125. Medium rare is usually 125 to 130. Uh, mediums 130, 135, and then medium well is 135, 140, and don't cook a ribeye over 140. You're just a, eat a hamburger. Yeah, you get a shoe, get a shoe. <laughs> left. Oh, well done, man. <laughs> Anything over 140 is is well. I wouldn't. You wasted your money on a good cut of steak if you're cooking that thing to well. All right, so are we talking eight minutes really for the to, to cook a, a good medium rare ribeye? Because you mentioned that, the that for about be. two minutes. That's exactly right. It's usually about eight minutes if you've got your fire right. And then I like to give them at least a five-minute rest when they come off the grill. Because you realize we've got a lot of heat on there. We've hammered both sides with some good hot heat. And then we're, that meat's still trying to cook when you take it off. So you got to let it calm down. you got to let those juices go, uh, move back towards the center of the steak. If you cut into it as soon as you take it off, you're going to lose every bit of that moisture that's in there because that heat's pushed it all to the surface on both sides. So if you just let it calm down, let it stop cooking, let those temperatures stabilize, um, it'll be you'll have a better eating steak. And what you don't realize is that steak actually carries over about five to seven degrees for when you take it off. So especially in the, the medium rare, you know, a well a, a rare steak won't carry as far because it hadn't been on the heat as long. But the longer you leave it on that heat, the more your, your chance you got for it to be, you know, to carry over a little more. And if you want to step it up a little bit, I know that uh, you like to add a little, you can add some seasoning. I know you do a little butter, a little garlic that you melt. And, and uh, 
Uh, what is is that a, a type of butter people can buy, or or do you just make it up? Um, I've seen some different compound butters or seasoned butters for sale, but it's so easy to make. Um, I, I call it my steak butter. And so what I'll do is I'll just take a stick of, of regular uh, salted butter. You could use unsalted if you wanted to, if you're trying to watch the sodium. Take three, uh, two or three cloves of garlic, smash them up really good. Take you some shallot, mince it up really fine. And then take you a little bit of fresh herb like parsley uh, works really well. You could use a little bit of rosemary. And then you want to stir that into a stick of room temperature butter so it's all incorporated in the butter. And then pull out some plastic wrap and then kind of uh, spoon that butter out onto the plastic wrap, fold it up and kind of roll it into a log, kind of to where it's back into stick form. And then stick that in the coldest spot of your refrigerator up top. And that butter will get back hard to where you can slice it. And then when you, when you take it out, you can put it, you can melt it on your grill. You can put it in a pan and brush it on during those last few two minutes while you're, you know, getting your steak finished, or you can just cut it into pats and lay them, lay it up there and let it be melting down. Um, mm-hmm. I've even in, in my latest recipe, um, I, I made what I call a steak butter sauce. And I just put those pats of butter on the plate that I was going to rest the steak on. I take the steak off and just let it sit there. And so it gets flavored from the bottom and all that butter melts out and you can pour it up into a little, a little dipping cup and you got something to dip your steak in as you eat it. Man, you're making me hungry, Malcolm. Just talking about all this. I you on that one. <laughs> uh, I love a good steak. I really do. Um, so w- once we pull that that steak off, um, I mean, there, there's also a whole science to how you cut the meat, isn't it? I mean, you you cut it with there's there is a grain to beef, and, sure. and so how do you cut it? Well, most steaks are already cut the right way, a ribeye especially. So you can just kind of I just cut it across it typically. You don't have to get into it. It's not like slicing up a brisket or you know slicing up a tri-tip, something where you really got to follow that grain because, uh, you know, they've already been cut across the grain when they took it off the loin. So it, when, you're eating a, when you're eating a steak from a restaurant or when you cook at your house, you don't have to worry about it as bad. But, you, but it's always important to know that if you've got a piece of meat and you can see the grain in it, you want to cut across it. Shortens those protein fibers and it makes it more tender to cut across the area. Yeah, it really is a science, and uh, I think that we've uh, given people a lot of information today about uh, doing the steak right. Uh, do you do you grill up some veggies with that too? Do you do you ever do that where you uh, put them on the grill, or you, or you keep the, that part stay in the kitchen? One of the one of our favorite ones at our house is to do asparagus on the grill to go with our steaks. Man, we'll take you know we'll take a bunch of tender uh, young tender asparagus and just cut the woody stem off. Uh, toss it in just a touch of olive oil and then season it with just a little bit of salt and pepper. Real simple. And then that'll cook right on the grate, right beside your steaks. And it takes it um, maybe the same amount of time as your steak to cook. Uh, you know, um, I usually like to, to cook them about 450 to 500 degrees, about eight to 10 minutes. So you can cook that asparagus. You just want to move it ever so often. The asparagus rolls really easy on the grill too. There's not a whole lot of flipping, you know, turning. You have to do spatula work. It's really good. Yeah. So, Malcolm, uh, it sounds like if you take the time that you can really uh, cook a great steak every time, if you do it right. Once you, once you learn, <coughs> excuse me, Sean, <coughs> got a little uh, catch. But once you learn um, how to cook that steak properly, man, it's nothing to it. It's one of the easiest things you can grill, and it's and man, it, you'll never pay for another steak in a steakhouse. In fact, you'll find yourself going to a restaurant and, and saying, to, you know, and saying, that, man, I could do so much better. Why did I just pay 40 bucks for this steak when I could have done it at home? Yeah, I mean, these days, man, you go into a restaurant. Really, I was uh, in, in Vegas last week, and of course, that uh, cost a bit. But I mean, they had steaks in there, were, you know, 60, 70 dollars. Sure. And uh, you can do it at home and, and do it right. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I want to do a, an episode on this, uh, Malcolm, because. I just feel so bad for for people. I've been invited over to people's homes, and I'm like, oh my goodness, man, you just just ruined a really nice cut of meat because they don't know how to do it right. And uh, I really appreciate you uh, coming on and, and telling us how to do that. Uh, I'd love to have you on in future episodes. So we, when we step this up, because uh, love to hear about you know how to cook a good rack of ribs. Uh, you know, you do some uh, great uh, uh, smokes uh, that uh, with the different equipment that you have. And there are so many different things you can do with barbecue. 
That's exactly right, man. I'd love to come back and we'll, you know, we'll go through uh, cooking something else. You just name it and uh, let me know a date and time, man. Yeah, and folks, I'm going to put up all the links here. Uh, the one that's most important is to uh, how to how to bbq right dot com, and uh, Malcolm's got you know all his videos up there. And when you get done watching them, you're going to want to run to the store and <laughs> and pick up whatever he's been cooking and try and uh, reinvent it in your own house, and and you can do it. So uh, Malcolm, really, thank you so much, and and we're definitely going to have you back on. I really enjoyed this uh, conversation. Hey, it's been fun, Sean. I appreciate it, man. It's good talking to you. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much, and uh, we'll chat soon. Have a good oh, one. Anything else you wanted to plug while we're on? Uh, I, no, man. You pretty much did it. You can find me at How to Barbecue Right Everywhere. So if yeah. anybody's got questions or anything, uh, send them to our Facebook page. That's We try to answer all of them, and I, you know, I try to help people out when I can. So it's all about getting people out and firing up those grills and putting some smoke in the air. All right, man. Malcolm, thank you so much. Have a good one. All right.